This evening, we're turning to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Now, three Sundays ago, we began our study in Daniel chapter 7, and two Sundays ago, we continued our study by looking at the kingdom of Satan, which we are going to continue to study this evening. We were learning about the horns of chapter 7. And in a moment, we'll do some reviewing to bring you back up to speed because it's been a couple of weeks. And then we will uh, we'll actually go and cover some that we didn't get to cover. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless the reading, the teaching, uh, the preaching of thy precious word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Daniel's prophecies. And thank you, Lord, that there are those who have um, made it possible uh, for us to better understand uh, these uh, precious truths uh, that we have here in Daniel. We pray you'll guide and direct. I pray, Lord, you'll help me to be clear and precise and correct and to teach thy word in a way that uh, will bring gl glory to thy name and edify thy people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me remind you of something, and uh, it is this, that um, God told Daniel at the end of his book to seal these things until the end times. Now, for a very, very long time, a thousand years or more, uh, God's people really had a hard time going through the book of Daniel. And a lot of times they looked at it as if it was only talking about, especially in these places, uh, the time of Daniel period, and then into you know the Greek and the Roman Empire, and that was it. And so in, in many ways, they kind of ignored it after that because, well, what was the point? It was all past. But I do believe we are living in the latter days. And uh, I believe that's one of the reasons we are able today to better understand the book of Daniel as well as the book of Revelation. And remember, Daniel and Revelation must go together. Uh, the one completes the other. Now, for some review, uh, the first thing we talked about was, uh, of course, we had talked about the beast, and then we talked about the ten horns. <clears throat> the ten horns are mentioned, first of all, verses 7 and 8, and says, After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with his feet, it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, as we're looking uh, at this uh, portion of, of Scripture, uh, you may wonder, well, why am I skipping certain points? Don't worry about that. I'll come back to them. Not tonight, but we will cover these other portions. Uh, go with me, if you will, to verse 24, uh, the same chapter here. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Then, if you will, take your Bibles, and like I said last time we did that, put your, keep your hand here in Daniel, or at least mark it somehow, and then we're going to go to the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to first go to chapter 13.
and uh, verse 1. <clears throat> then I stood on the sand of the sea. This is John speaking. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Uh, then go over a few chapters, over to chapter 17, and uh, first verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names and of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And then verse 7. The angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And then down to verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And then verse 16. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Now, these ten horns represent ten kings or kingdoms, and they will exist in the last days. Uh, when uh, the... Uh, European Union came about, many people said, oh, well, that's the fulfillment of this. And uh, that sounded really good until we got, began to add more countries to the European Union, and now there's much more 10. Uh, and I think that we're jumping a little bit ahead there when we do that. But I do believe that uh, the, this kingdom, this, these kingdoms that will come together will be out of the old Roman Empire as far as, and so uh, mostly of us would hold to somewhere in that area that there are going to be ten nations who are going to rise up. And, and as we, we are seeing even now at times, uh, you know, we see the breaking away of nations and then we see nations being uh, swallowed up again. And so those kinds of things can keep on taking place. Uh, we don't know which the, these nations are, but we know that it's going to be out of that uh, old Roman Empire. Now, the Antichrist is going to come, and the one world kingdom, the final kingdom, will be organized and actively oppose God and his people. And then we read about the little horn in verse 8. Uh, in Daniel chapter uh, 7. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Uh, then, if you'll go down to verse 11, and I watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flames. Then go down to verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time. Now, this represents the last world ruler, the man called the Antichrist. Now, uh, the Bible tells us there will be antichrists, all right? There will be these different ones who will rise up. But this is talking about the final antichrist. Now, the Greek uh, prefix uh, anti uh, means both against and instead of. And 
the Antichrist is going to be against Christ and he's going to be in place of. He will be a false Christ. Uh, and so he's going to be a counter Christ and, and the enemy. According to Daniel, the Antichrist has to overcome the power of three other rulers to be able to do what he wants to do and what Satan uh, has planned for him to do. And we see that uh, in verse 24, uh, the ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom and shall rise and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. And he will blaspheme God and ultimately convince unbelieving world that he actually is God. Now, the word blaspheme means to, um, to speak uh, of God in an irreverent, uh, impious uh, manner. Uh, again, keep your hand where you are, but go to the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. And let me remind you also, uh, 2 Thessalonians does deal a great deal with uh, the end times. Not in any great detail, but it, it is there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 1. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, and that's when Christ comes back, all right, we, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. See, some of them were being told that the day of Christ had already come. There are those who have proclaimed that Jesus Christ has come back. Uh, and, and, uh, and this has happened at different times through the last 2,000 years. And there are those who claim that like in 18-something that Christ came back uh, or was coming back. He didn't come back, and so they said, well, he came spiritually back. He didn't come physically back. That's one way of doing it. He goes on, he said, do not let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or uh, that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they shall believe the lie and that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So all of that he's talking about the unsaved. Those who refuse to believe in Christ are going to, they're going to believe a strong lie. 
And you know, many of us sitting there think, well, why wouldn't they believe? Why? Because they don't want to believe. And they're going to believe, and so they won't, don't want to believe, and so they're going to, they're going to believe this strong lie that's going to come. Now, the Antichrist will become the ruler of the world and will control not only the economy, but also religion. He is going to set up his own religion. It'll be a worldwide religion. And as the Bible says, he's going to seek to change times and laws. So he is going to change, you know, be changing all kinds of things that are going to take place. Now, according to Daniel 7.25, Revelation 3, 5, his dictatorship will last three and a half years. Now, the tribulation period is seven years long. At some point, he will, he will be a ruler and everything, but he's not going to come the power, the power that he will have until the middle, what we call middle of tribulation period after three and a half years. Then he's going to reign for three and a half years. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, uh, it is, states as times, times, and a half a time. A time, one year. Times, two years. Half a time, half a year. Three and a half years. It's also referred to 42 months in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, and chapter 13 and verse 5. And if you want to do your math, that comes out to three and a half years. And then it also is referred to 1,260 days in Revelation 11:3. And 12, 6, which comes out, if you want to do that math, three and a half years. This is, period is the second half of the tribulation period. All right, that's the review. <laughs> so, now we're going to look at the scenario. Antichrist will be leading one of the ten confederate nations. He will be one of these leaders, initially. He will overcome three other nations and their leaders with the help of Satan, and then he will move into becoming a world dictator. At first he will appear to be very friendly to the Jewish people, and he's going to sign a seven-year covenant to protect them. And that's, we believe, is why they will be able to build the temple. Because remember, where the temple was now stands the Dome of the Rock. You can imagine with all of the, what goes on in the Middle East between Israel and all these Arab nations over and over and over, you can not imagine what would happen if today they would try to step in there and they would try to build the temple. They would have to tear down the Dome of the Rock and build the, Talk about wars. It wouldn't just be Hamas, it wouldn't just be Egypt, it would be every Arab nation will come against them, and who knows who else. So, but we know that the temple is going to be built because it says that in the middle of the three and a half years, that it, uh, the middle of the tribulation period, that the Antichrist is going to set his statue up in the temple. So the temple will have to be built. The sacrifices are going to begin again. So there will be the building of the temple. So the Antichrist, will, they're going to look at him like, wow, this is fantastic. Look at what he has been able to do. Imagine somebody coming along and being able to bring that kind of peace to the Middle East. It would be just incredible. And uh, in the 27th chapter says, 
Uh, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve him and obey him. That's when the Christ is going to finally come back. So the signing of that covenant is the signal for the start of the seven years of the tribulation period. And it's the last seven years of Daniel's 70 weeks uh, that uh, Daniel talks about uh, in his, uh, in his uh, revelation as, as he gives it to us. Now, this period is, is generally known as the tribulation, I said, and it's described in Matthew, in Mark, in Revelation chapters 6 through 19. What I will do is just uh, take us to uh, one place, and that is Matthew 24. Again, you'll want to keep your hand, possibly, into Daniel chapter 7. And in Matthew chapter 24, we're going to begin with verse 1. Now remember, 24 and 25, Jesus is talking about the end times, but he doesn't give you great detail, all right? He's just given an overview. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him uh, to show him the, building of the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And by the way, that takes place in A.D. 70. A.D. 70, the temple is destroyed. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdom. And by the way, if you go back in the history, it was, it was you know, empire, and then one empire totally replaced another empire, and that kind of a thing. This is makes it clear that there is going to be different nations and kingdoms who are going to be destroying each other. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, after three and a half years, tribulation period, after the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to break the covenant that he has made with Israel, set up his own image in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, forcing the world to worship him and the devil who energizes him. Now, just give you a little bit more. He is he's going to be the world ruler, the Antichrist. He's going to also have a one who will come and will be the religious ruler of the world. There will be one, we could call him a pope, and then they will be the devil. That's the devil's trinity. 
Using the language of Daniel, Jesus called this the abomination of desolation. Now, holding your hand here in Matthew, but going to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. That is the placing of his statue there in the temple. The sacrifice will be taken away. All that worship that has been taken to place for three and a half years will be done away with. Now, back in Matthew chapter 24, notice verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, so when is that going to be? Middle of the tribulation period. Spoken of by whom? Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Now, we're not going to be there, all right? But this is, Jesus is writing to the Jews. So, when the tribulation take, takes place, the Jewish people will begin to read the scriptures. And they'll begin to read the New Covenant, the New Testament. And they're going to come across all of this. And they're going to be warned then of what's going to take place. Also, you can read this in Mark 13 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, this signals... The last half of the tribulation, a period that is known also as the wrath of God. Again, let's go to Revelation and uh, chapter 14, first of all. Revelation chapter 14. And verse 10, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Then verse 19, so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Then in chapter 15, verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And then verse 7, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And for those of you who remember my early days here, we went over this. That was a while ago. Sorry I can't do it again. Then over to chapter 19. No, let's see. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll go to something else. But, but that's all right. It was interesting. I was uh, reading my devotions the other day, and uh, I also noticed in Psalm 110, verses 4 through 6, talking about the wrath of God in this time. Now, all of this is going to climax with the return of Jesus Christ. At the end of seven years, then Christ is going to come to the earth. Now, he's going to have come just before the tribulation period begins. He'll come above the earth. He will call forth the church, the body of Christ, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Then the tribulation period starts. At the end of the seven years, Christ comes back to the earth itself. All right? Not in the clouds, but to the earth. 
and he is going to defeat the Antichrist and his army. Uh, back in um, Matthew for a moment. <clears throat> and can you guess what chapter? 24. It's probably behind me there. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be, will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Then now learn this parable. By the way, there will be Jews and Christians, uh, Jews and Gentiles, who will come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior during the tribulation period. Okay? Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaf, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. What is that? Christ coming back. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. So anybody who tells you that they know are lying through their teeth. Because God said they won't know. Jesus said they won't know. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Things were just going along just fine. Did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house who had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then going to Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. <clears throat> now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. He who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written uh, that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe of dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in white, fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet, that's the one who will lead the world religion, 
He who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And then Christ will establish his millennial kingdom on the earth. Now, more verses I could give you here, but uh, you can write them down. You can write down Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, uh, 26 through 27, Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. Daniel doesn't go into all the details that John shares in the book of uh, Revelation. But he does assure us that the kingdom of Satan and his counterfeit, Christ, will be defeated and destroyed by Christ. I'm going to stop there tonight. Um, I was going to try to go a little bit further, but um, I've got so much more to cover that we don't have really the time to do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have these revelations because it does tell us of the end times. It tells us what is going to take place. It tells us of this world ruler, Antichrist, who will pretend he's the Christ, and yet he'll be against Christ, and that People all over the world will be deceived. They will believe the lie. We have seen, Lord, historically over the centuries, as we look at history, people believing a great lie. Help us, Lord, to be diligent in the study of the Word of God and the Scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth so that we might be sure that we understand thy word, the signs of the season, the signs of the times, and most of all to be looking for the return of Jesus Christ. And we thank you in his precious name. Amen.